Hello everyone and welcome to my talk. Today I will be presenting on the work I have done with the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility Data Science Group at Argonne National Labs this summer under the SUBI program. I'm very excited to be discussing my project about FLOPS Aware Deep Learning. This is a short abstract summarizing my work. If you are interested, please feel free to pause the video here to read over it. However, note that I will be discussing my project in depth in the following slides. In today's day and age, computers are becoming a huge part of our lives. They proliferate every imaginable industry and have helped solve thousands of problems much faster than humans could have solved them on their own. One such field of computer science which is growing at an astounding rate is machine learning, specifically a subsection of machine learning which we refer to as deep learning. Deep learning entails the creation of programs that we call neural networks. In recent years, these neural networks have been built and trained to accomplish tasks like image recognition, language translation, speech recognition, and the list goes on. Think about applications like face recognition technology or Siri on your iPhone. These neural networks are extremely useful and accurate for several purposes, including conducting science. However, since the inception of neural networks, they have become increasingly complicated in their architectures. Many modern neural networks require a huge amount of computational resources, like specialized GPUs, to be trained and used for inference purposes. This is not ideal because it limits the real world applications of neural networks. Individuals or organizations without sufficient computational capacity won't be able to utilize or build powerful neural networks, which is harmful for progress in this field. One way to measure how good a neural network is performing on its underlying hardware is to calculate the number of floating point operations per second, or FLOPs, that the network can achieve. Simply put, FLOPs are the number of additions, subtractions, multiplications, and divisions that a computer is able to compute in one second. We want to design a neural network that can maximize the number of FLOPs that are achieved on the GPU. To accomplish this problem, we must understand the types of computational resources available to us, and then optimize the architectures of our neural networks to use these resources to the max capacity. In my case, I was working with NVIDIA's A100 GPU. To give you an idea of how powerful the A100 GPU is, in ideal circumstances, it can achieve 156 teraflops when you use a specific type of number called a single precision float while the average laptop CPU can only achieve in the order of hundreds of gigaflops, that is trillions of flops versus billions of flops respectively. So the A100 is theoretically a very powerful machine. However, unless you write your programs and neural network architectures in a very specific way, you probably will never be able to exploit the A100 GPU's full potential. As a matter of fact, this is the case for most computers. The question of how to create an efficient neural network is one that I set out to solve. To understand my journey, you must understand that neural networks are made up of various layers. When you stack these layers together, you are able to accomplish increasingly difficult tasks like image recognition. So I began my study by first individually looking at different common neural network layers like linear, convolutional, GRU, and LSTM layers. At a high level, I used a software called DeepHyper which was able to perform a Bayesian circuit model-based search and find the ideal configurations of each of these layers that I wanted to study, such that the GPU would perform the maximum number of flops. Next, I looked at two well-known image classification neural networks called AlexNet and VGG16, and found the ideal construction of the layers within the network to reach peak flops in much the same way I did for individual layers. We then trained the original and optimized models of AlexNet and VGG16 on several image datasets and observed the differences. Once we had optimized versions for AlexNet and VGG16, we trained the original and optimized networks for two different tasks each, to classify images from the Cypher 10 dataset and to classify images from the Fruits dataset. If you're interested in the specifics of these datasets, please pause the video to read the specifications on the slide and see the references on the last slide. This is a general breakdown of my model training process for both AlexNet and VGG16. I hard-coded the number of epochs I trained each model for. I used stochastic gradient descent as my optimizer with a learning rate of 0 0.001 and momentum of 0.9, which are pretty standard hyperparameter values in the field. Additionally, I broke my data sets up into training and validation sets. I checked the validation accuracy 
after every epoch, as I stated before, I also had a fixed number of epochs for each training loop. While we don't have time to go through the optimization for every layer and architecture I have studied in this presentation, I want to walk through a few key points of the optimization for AlexNet for the ImageNet dataset to help you better understand the process. My first step is to implement AlexNet using the DeepHyper framework and to provide DeepHyper the mechanism to calculate the number of flops AlexNet would perform in one forward pass over the network. DeepHyper then performs a Bayesian circuit model based search where it chooses different variable values for the architecture components like linear layer size or convolutional channels or filter sizes from ranges that I have specified and centered around the values from the original network. We can then visualize the performance of the network with various values for each of these variables in the graphs pictured on the slide where the x axis is the variable's range and the y axis is the number of flops achieved. These graphs can give us insight into the types of choices we can make in our network to make it more efficient. We want to look for peaks in the graphs so we can observe what variable values result in higher flops. For example, we see that the number of output channels for the first convolution, there is a peak around what looks to be 128 channels. This makes intuitive sense since GPUs are naturally hardwired to perform faster for certain shape configurations. However, these graphs alone don't always show the relationships in performance between different network components, which is why we rely on DeepHyper to provide us the most performant configurations or some of the most performant configurations of the network. By using DeepHyper to optimize neural network layers and full architectures, we see a significant improvement in terms of flops performance for inference purposes when comparing original models to optimized models. When I say inference, I'm referring to the idea of using an already trained model to accomplish a task. The question then remains, do these computationally efficient models perform as accurately as the original models? And the answer is yes, they generally do. It can, as you can see above, the original AlexNet achieves 46.72 teraflops for one forward pass over the network, while the optimized network achieves 95.25 teraflops. This is about double the performance of the original. And if you look at the graph, you will see the original model's accuracy in blue dots and the high flops model in orange dots over the validation image set while it was being trained on the Cypher 10 dataset. Both the orange and blue dots closely follow one another, indicating that there is no trade-off in accuracy due to training in choosing the high flops model. Additionally, it takes the same amount of time to train both models. This slide depicts AlexNet's performance over the fruits dataset. Similar to the Cypher 10 dataset classification task, the high flops model vastly outperforms the original model when it comes to inference without sacrificing accuracy during training. Once again, we achieve similar timing for training. Now we show the results of VGG16 trained on the Cypher 10 dataset. We observe an increase of about 10 teraflops between the original and flops optimized models, which isn't as drastic as it was for AlexNet, but significant nonetheless. Additionally, the accuracies of both models follow one another, which is once again positive news. In this case, the high flops model did take longer to train. These results show the training of VGG16 on the fruits dataset, and the results are similar to the previous slide. There are no trade-offs in accuracy in choosing the high flops model. And as you can see, there's about a 10 teraflop increase in performance for one forward pass over the network, as shown in that blue writing and there is about a 30 minute increase in training time for the optimized model. In conclusion, what we have learned is that the throughput for inference or one forward pass through a flops optimized neural network can be greatly optimized compared to the original models by using DeepHyper to perform an architecture centric parameter search. However, the time to train a high flops model is much more variable. In some cases, it takes the same amount of time as the original model, and in some cases, it takes more time. This isn't necessarily a huge problem if training is only done once and the model is used largely for inference purposes. However, this will be a future point of investigation. Furthermore, there's very little effect on accuracy in choosing the high flops model versus the original model. This is great preliminary news because it indicates that high flops models have the potential to be just as useful as the original models. In the future, we hope to continue to understand and optimize flops in neural networks, specifically for training purposes.
Additionally, we would like to benchmark our current models on the FAST ImageNet dataset. And in general, we want to expand our investigation to include more models in different types of layers so that we understand what architecture choices are best suited for different hardwares. These are my references. Please check them out for further reading if you are interested. I would like to thank the SULI program as well as Dr. Kyle Felker, Dr. Taylor Childers, and the entire Archon Leadership Computing Facility Data Science team for supporting me and my research. Thank you for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions at all, feel free to write me an email.